Are you ready to get into the Word? We're in a series called By Faith. Are you being blessed by it? Is your faith being strengthened? Is your faith being inspired? Are you growing in faith? Are you being encouraged? Then it's having the intended effect that we wanted it to have. Turn in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10, we're going to begin in verse, eh, let's start in verse 35. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 35 says this, Cast not away therefore your confidence, which has great recompense of reward. Everybody say that. Say, uh, 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 by, faith, by faith I live. I live. And, because it, and because of it I have a great recompense, have a great recompense of, reward of reward in store for me. Store. Does it pay to serve God? Does it pay to have faith in God? It pays in the long run. It pays in the short run. When you have faith in God, it will pay off your debt. It will pay off your bills. If you'll simply just have faith in God, if you'll go at life by faith, there is great recompense of reward for you. Verse 36, For you have need of patience, that after you have done the will of God, you might receive the promise. Take note of that. Not everything you want to happen happens overnight. Just because you pray about something tonight, just because you get some agree about something tonight, yes, the Word of God goes right to the root of it. An instantaneous work begins to take place in your life, but that's no guarantee that you're going to receive the result of it in one or two weeks. Hence the importance of us learning how to stand upon the Word of God. Let the Word of God be our foundation. And as we stand and develop in patience, we will see the will of God where the Word of God is known in our life. We will see the will of God performed in our life. And those things that you desire, those things that you've asked for agreement for, you'll see those things come to pass. Verse 37, For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. Verse 38, now the just shall live by faith. Everybody say that. The just shall live by faith. But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But we are not of them who draw back unto perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. Now, notice the contrast here. Notice the contradiction. Faith is active. Unbelief is passive. Faith is what? Faith does something unbelief refuses to do anything. Faith advances, unbelief retreats. Faith lays hold of something while uh, 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 doubt and unbelief is willing to just let it go. Hence the problem with today's popular church catchphrase of just let go and let God. That is problematic. Uh, just let go and let God. Now if you mean you're letting go of your worry, if you're letting go of your depression, if you're letting go of your pain, your unforgiveness, your bitterness, if you're letting go of those things and trusting God to do a work in your life, then okay. But seriously, more times than not, that's not what people mean when they say that, let go and let God. What they are implying is, is I'm going to get out of God's way. I'm, I'm going to stop or not do anything, and I'm just going to trust God to just take over and do it. No, you can't leave up to Him what He has already left up to you, and that is to walk and to live by faith. Hebrews 11.1 1 says what? Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Not yesterday's faith, not past faith, not tomorrow's faith, not future faith. If you want to know, and yes, faith has a tense, it is the present tense. It is now. Remember this as we get on uh, into, uh, into some things here later on uh, in some stories that we're going to be looking at. Faith has a tense. It is now. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Verse 2, for by it, by what? By faith the elders obtained a good report. I'd much rather have a good report operating in my life than a bad report. How many of you are up for some good reports? How about we just lay claim to some good reports tonight? How many of you could use a good report? Has anybody gotten a bad report that you want to replace with a good report? You do it by faith. We walk and we live by faith. I'd much rather operate and have a good report. I'm seeking. I desire. I'm thankful that I have good reports. I'm thankful that I have good news for you tonight. There's no bad news in anything that I'm going to share tonight unless you just choose to rebel and go up against it and kick against the pricks. It's all good news for the believer. It's all good news for the Christian. We have a good report. 
In verse 6 it says, By faith, but excuse me, but without faith it is impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. There is no amount of praying, there is no amount of giving you can do that will please God unless it is accompanied and tethered to faith. If it is not, then there is no amount of praying, there is no giving that will please God unless it is done by faith. So our part is not just to believe that God is, that He, that, uh, that he is, we are also to believe something that goes to the very nature, the very character, and the very will of God, and that is what? That He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. It is amazing how many people still don't believe that God wants to reward you for diligently seeking Him. They have problems when pastors, uh, ministers, men of God, traveling ministers, the five-fold ministry, a lot of people have problems when they prosper because they're diligently seeking God. They get upset as a congregant. They get upset as, a, uh, uh, as somebody who's just in the church. But how many of you also understand the flip of that is also true? That pastors also have the opportunity. The fivefold ministry also has the opportunity to get upset when they see their congregation getting blessed and they're scratching their heads. Well, Lord, why, why, why are things happening here? Why are things happening in my life? No, God is not a respecter of people. If God would do it for a minister, He would do it for you. If God would do it for you, then He would do it for a minister. He would do it for a pastor. So we rejoice in other people's success. I rejoice in your success. Why don't you rejoice in those who things are going well? They have their own challenges. They have their own issues. But as long as you are doing things and they're in faith, you're in faith, guess what? You both end up with a good report. Now we keep on seeing throughout this the by faith. By faith Noah, by faith Abel, by faith Abraham. And we've gone all the way down. My dad has done a masterful job getting us all the way down to verse 30. Verse 30 of Hebrews chapter 11 says this. By faith the walls, you know, stop right there. By faith. You know that clause will answer a thousand and one questions in your life. By faith will answer a thousand and one questions in your life. Well, how is this going to do? How is this going to come to pass? By faith. Amen. Why? By faith. That's it. When? By faith. Amen. Who? By faith. Where? By faith. Amen. A thousand and one questions that you probably have can be answered simply by that catchphrase, by faith. By faith, verse 30, the walls of Jericho fell down. And after they were compassed, uh, compassed about seven days. By faith, excuse me, by faith, the harlot Rahab perished not with them that believed not when she had received the spies with peace. Now, we're going to take verse 30 and 31 and we're going to uh, begin to unpack them tonight. Now, I'm going to go ahead and forewarn you that uh, uh, this is going to be a two part message. Uh, I will not be able to get through everything tonight unless you want to stay till 10 o'clock. Anybody up for that? Okay, I didn't think so. So anyway, we're going to unpack this uh, tonight, and then the next time I have an opportunity, uh, I will finish up and uh, give the conclusion of this. But we see that these two verses are intertwined. These two verses, by faith the walls of Jericho fell down, and by faith Rahab perish not, or in other words, we'll find she saved her and her entire family. These two uh, incidences of by faith, they happened at the same place, and they happened at the same time. Now, the Israelites' faith in obeying God when it came to the walls of Jericho coming down, there is, the Israelites' faith in God in obeying God caused the barrier between them and and what God had promised them to fall flat. The Israelites' faith in verse 30 caused those walls to fall flat. Please note that it does not say the walls crumbled. There are translations that use that phrase, they get it wrong. Those walls did not crumble, they fell flat. So that the army of Israel, so that the nation of Israel could walk up basically on a ramp and spoil the city of Jericho. Those walls fell flat. God promised them that they would come down. They came up against a barrier, and God told them that if you'll do this, if you'll march around the city 
one time a day, and on the seventh day, seven times a day, and shout, those walls are going to come down. The Israelites, in that verse, in verse 30, references their faith up against a barrier. Where have we seen that before? My dad here recently has been sharing about Moses. They faced a barrier, did they not? The crossing of the Red Sea. In the same way, the Israelites have come up against a barrier that seems to go all the way to the heavens. And yet when they came up against a barrier of the Red Sea, it went from here for miles, or what seemed like probably miles across the width of a piece of land. They came up against a barrier, one was wide, one was tall, and yet we see that God got them through both. The Red Sea represented a barrier that seemed uncrossable. But when you mix faith with you coming into a position where you see a barrier that it seems like I can't get across this. There's no way I can get from here to there. There's no way that I'm going to be able to go from this position to that position. When you get to that position, if you will simply have faith in God, then back in verse 29, you'll find the same uncrossable Red Sea that I'm sure looked like that to many of the Israelites when they came up against it. You will find that when you mix faith with that, God will part the waters and you'll walk through on dry ground. Now don't miss that because water plus dirt equals what? mud. They walked past on dry ground. They didn't get their feet stuck in mud where they're having to lift their feet and it becomes a chore to them. Those walls have not only stood at attention, there has been like a huge fan come through and cause that ground to be dry so they don't lose their footing so that they don't get stuck. How many of you know God doesn't want you you stuck? He doesn't want you to get stuck in the middle of your miracle. He doesn't want you to get stuck in the middle of the manifestation that He has for you. He's going to completely dry the ground so you can go from here to there at what once looked like an uncrossable barrier, but you have to have faith in God. And the same way they come up against a wall that seems impenetrable and it seems unscalable to them. Because many say that while the walls of Jericho may have only been about four stories high, the way that they presented themselves looked much larger than that, almost 10 stories high, almost double that because of the way that they presented themselves to the land around. That must have seemed unimpenetrable. That must have seemed unscalable. So we have these barriers, the Red Sea. We have uh, uh, the walls of Jericho. Why does God in Hebrews 11 record these? Why are these barriers Uh, these examples of barriers and these uh, examples that people come up against, why are they given to you and I? Because we all know that in life we're going to come up against barriers. We're all going to come up against barriers. We're all going to come up with something that seems uncrossable. We're all going to come up against something that seems impenetrable, something that seems unscalable. We're going to come up with something that we get there and we think, I can't do this. As a matter of fact, that's where unbelief will try to seep in. That's where doubt will try to seep in and try to tell you the enemy will come in and try to tell you that you're finished. It's over. The natural man wants to run in those kind of situations. They want to turn back and go to where it's comfortable. They want to go back and get, uh, uh, (coughs) excuse me, get back to where they feel comfortable and what they were once doing. No, when you come up against a barrier by faith, You put your trust in God, and that which seems unscalable now becomes a ramp for you to advance in life. That's what the walls of Jericho are like. That's why these barriers are recorded, so that you and I can know that what seems unscalable and impenetrable, when you have faith in God, those things become flat and plain so that you can advance in life. This is why it's important that you begin to talk faith when? Yesterday? No. Tomorrow? No. Now. Even when things are running smooth in your life. 
even more importantly when things are running smooth in your life. Don't just wait for the barrier to pop up. Well, now it's time to do it by faith. Now it's time to get in faith. No, when things are going so well, when your accounts are overflowing, when your family loves being around you, when you are healthy in body, when everything to be, seems to be going right, no wrong in your life, that is still the time to continue to speak the Word of God. Why? Because when that barrier does present itself, you still need to be fully persuaded that what God started in you, He will complete in you, He will finish in you, and He will get you to the other side of that barrier. Start talking now. Whether things are good or whether things are bad, start talking faith right now. In verse 30, the nation of Israel by faith saw the walls of Jericho come down. In verse 31, you have, excuse me, in verse 30, you see an entire nation. You see Joshua, the leader of the, uh, 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 the nation of Israel. You see the leadership of of the nation of Israel approaching this barrier by faith. But in the middle of this story, we see a woman by Rahab named Rahab the harlot. And in the midst of the Israelites going up against Jericho, this Rahab the harlot, by faith, perished not when everyone else was wiped out according to the Word of God, She saved her and her entire family by faith. You got a corporation or a congregation that's operating by faith, they see a miracle. They see a barrier come down. And then you've got an individual over here that's just operating to protect her family. She does it by faith. Who is Rahab? Bible calls her Rahab the harlot. Now I hope you don't call her that in heaven when you meet her. But a harlot is what? The Bible doesn't shade her career. The Bible doesn't shade her profession. A harlot is a prostitute. She is a woman of the night. And here she is, by faith, saving her and her family. That ought to speak, that ought to speak volumes to you. That ought to say a lot to you. That it is amazing the places and the people whom you can find strong faith in. Well, I thought strong faith would, you know, be accompanied with, you know, such and such, you know, their titles and all that kind of stuff. No, here's a woman, a woman of the night, a career path that many look down upon, most everybody looks down upon, everybody would have, would question. Here she is, she is saving her family by faith. And yet you see strong faith and operation in her. That's why you can't just look at somebody and and, and, and just, man, you know, wow. They've got to have faith. They've got it all together. And yet maybe this little person over here, this older person, this this woman, this child or whatever it may be, you never know where you're going to find strong faith. A lot of times not in the places that you think. Why? Because God looks on the heart. God looks on the heart. And he not only accepts you, but he will use you, just like he did Rahab. He used Rahab the harlot to accomplish his will upon this earth. Now, to find her story, let's turn back over to Joshua chapter 1. And Joshua chapter 1, once again, all this is intertwined. And so just bear with me as we walk some of this out, because I'm laying the foundation for what is uh, coming up in part 2 down the road. But in verse 1 of Joshua chapter 1 it says, Now after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spake unto Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister, saying, Stop right there. The Lord spake to Joshua. Right? Remember that. The Lord spake to Joshua. The Lord God. God spoke to Joshua. So Joshua's at attention. He's listening to God. What does God say? Verse 2, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan now, and all these people unto the land which I give to them, even to the children of Israel. Verse 3, every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that have I I given unto you, as I said unto Moses. Verse 5, there shall not be any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. I will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. Be strong and of good courage. 
For unto this people shalt thou divide for an inheritance the land which I swear unto thy, their fathers to give them. Only be thou strong and very courageous that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded thee. Turn not from it to the right hand or to the left that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Have not I commanded thee, be strong and of good courage, be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. God spoke all of that to Joshua. Saying, you're about to enter, you're about to take possession of that which I swore to your fathers. That land of promise that I have been telling you about, that I spoke to Moses about, that your parents have been telling you about, you're about to go get that. And I want you to understand that as you go, yeah, you may, you may face some things. You may face uh, some armies. You may come up against some walls. You may come up against some cities. But guess what? Not a man will be able to stand before you. All you need to do is take courage and do not fear. That is so, so important. Why? Because we need to understand that every word that God speaks to us whether it's through the Word of God, whether it's through someone ministering, it always carries meaning with it. So many times <coughs> we simply think that someone saying something to us is clearly or only communicating or conveying information or facts to us. No, that is not the way the Word of God is designed. It is not designed to just convey a thought or information to someone. Every word that is spoken through God, that is spoken by God, that is spoken through His Word carries with it a creative force. It carries with it an enlightening and an empowering. Therefore, when God is speaking to you, it's not just to give you some information. It's not just to tell you something. It is so that there is, you can create some things in your life so that you can be enlightened and so that you can be empowered for what lies ahead. That's the power of God's Word. That's why you need to understand the power of your words. Amen. That your words, especially when you're talking to someone, when, uh, when I'm communicating, when I am saying something, the hearer of that word, seriously and ultimately, is not just hearing information that I'm trying to pass along. There is an opportunity that when I'm speaking, I am creating something through the Word of God. By speaking, I am bringing enlightenment or I am bringing empowerment. Amen. That's the power of the Word of God. That's the power of your words. Right, wrong, good, bad, cursing, whatever it may be, your words always have an audience. Your words always have an audience. Whether you shout them, whether you mumble them, whether you stand before thousands, or whether you are simply speaking to yourself, your words have an audience. And that audience, and in that audience, something is being affected. Something is being created. Something is being enlightened. Something is being empowered. That's the power of your words. And that's what God has done right here. He is telling him some things. He's saying, look, I'm not just giving you some information. You're about to go create some things. Your, your eyes are about to be enlightened to the greatness of who I am. Some empowerment is about to come on you, and unlike anything you've ever seen. All you need to do is take courage. Do not be afraid, because when you come up against these barriers, no man will be able to stand in front of you. No one will. That's the word that Joshua had took back to the people as they begin this journey to take what God had promised them. Your words are creative. Your words are enlightening. Your words are empowering. That's the problem with today's catchphrase. I'm just saying. Yeah, come on. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. Oh, I'm just passing along some information. No, you're not. You're creating something. You're bringing enlightenment. You're, you're empowering something. That's the strength of your words. God hasn't changed. Faith hasn't changed. We have to overcome fear. We have to overcome laziness. 
We have to take courage and strength and walk by faith. When you see giants and when you see the wall, that is not when you turn back. That is not when you retreat. Yes, your inclination may be to run. That's what they did in Hebrews chapter 10, verse, 30, uh, verse 38, when it says they cast away their confidence. They drew back unto perdition. That's what they did. That's not what faith does. Faith advances. It doesn't retreat. When you throw your faith away, you're drawn back into perdition and you are retreating. That is not what faith does. Faith advances. Faith moves forward. And that is the, uh, uh, we find that that retreating, that drawing back, that is what the previous generation that came out of Egypt when God delivered them, that's the exact attitude that they had. They drew back. And because they drew back, they were not able to enter into the land of promise. They never got into it. An entire generation had to die off (coughs) before they were able to step into it. All because they drew back. All because they grumbled and complained and got upset with God. They didn't utilize, they didn't use their faith. They weren't strong and courageous when it came to taking the promised land. They drew back. And the Bible says, don't be of them that draw back, but unto them of the saving of the soul. That's you and I. That's the attitude that you and I have. They backed off. They lacked courage when they should have been advancing. God told Joshua these things. And that sets up the story for now, Rahab, in chapter 2. Chapter 2 of Joshua, verse 1. And Joshua the son of Nun sent out of Shittim two, uh, two men to spy secretly, saying, Go view the land, even Jericho. And they went and came into an harlot's house named Rahab and lodged there. And it was told the king of Jericho, saying, Behold, there came men in hither tonight of the children of Israel to search out the country. And the king of Jericho sent unto Rahab, saying, Bring forth the men that are come to thee, which are entered into thine house, for they, for they be come to search out all the country. And the woman took the two men and hid them, and said, unto the, uh, and said thus, There came men unto me, but I wist not whence they were. Stop right there. Rahab the harlot has immediately put her family in danger. Right there. She lied to the government. She lied to the king. She lied to the king's men. Her and her family are now in serious jeopardy. They are in peril. They are in imminent danger because of what she has just done. Traitorous. Where's the patriotism? Why are you, why, why are you, why are you hiding these men? Don't you, don't, don't, aren't, we a, aren't we a people? Aren't we a nation? Aren't we the city of Jericho? She has put her family in imminent danger. In verse 5, And it came to pass about the time, and this is uh, uh, Rahab speaking, And it came to pass about the time of of the shutting of the gate when it was dark that the men went out, whither the men went, I what not, pursue after them quickly, for you shall overtake them. That's a blatant lie. That's a blatant lie. So not only has she hid and done something treacherous and traitorous to her own country, she's now lied. But how many of you would probably could say, that she's got more issues than just lying. That may be one of her issues, but that's not all of her issues. She's a prostitute. She lies. She's not a person of the synagogue. Jericho, they worshiped idols. She worships, she worshiped false gods. As a matter of fact, uh, a part of their religion, a religion was practicing prostitution and sex acts. She's got some issues, not just lying. But do you understand the revelation behind all that? That you don't have to have it all together. That you do not have to have it all together. You do not have to have it all together to trust God. That He will accept you 
and he will use you if you just by faith trust him. You may have lied. You may have had a, a profession that is looked down upon. You may have done this. You may have done that. You do not have, yeah, people say, well, when I get everything together, then I'm going to turn to God. I've got all these issues to work out in my life. No, you bring all your issues to God. Whether it's lying, whether it's cheating, whether it's disobeying, whether it's mismanaging, whatever it may be, you bring all your issues to God. And if you'll do it by faith and trust Him, He will not only accept you, He will use you. That's the power of God's Word. And that's what He wants to fulfill in your life. Verse 6. But she had brought them up to the roof of the house, meaning the men, the spies, and hid them with the stalks of flax which she had laid in order upon the roof. And the men pursued after them the way to Jordan unto the fords, and as soon as they which were pursued after them were gone, they shut the gate. And before they were laid down, she came up upon them, upon, she came up unto them upon the roof. Now, starting in verse 9, I'm going to do my best to expound this, but I really encourage you to pay attention to every single word that is written here. And she said, Rahab, <coughs> excuse me, Rahab said unto the spas, the men, I know that the Lord hath given you the land, and that your terror is fallen upon us all, and that all the inhabitants of the land faint because of you. Now, she said to the Israelite spies, I know. How did she know? How? They didn't have CNN, thank God. (laughs) They didn't have Fox News. There's no newspapers even at that time. You don't have the Jericho podcast going on. You may have a, a town crier that is shouting out reports of this and that. How does she know these things? How does she know that the Lord, the Lord, has given them the land and that your terror is fallen upon us and that all the inhabitants of the land faint because of you. How does she know? Verse 11. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt and what you did unto the two kings of the Amorites that were on the other side, Jordan, Sion, and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. How did she know? She heard. How does faith come? Do you think faith is now present in her life? I don't know how that hits you. But when I saw that, as I was just reading through that, she knows that the, the land is Israel's. She only knows because she has heard of these reports. She has heard about the Red Sea, that uncrossable barrier. She has heard of when they came out of Egypt and the signs and the wonders that God did and performed. She has heard about the two kings of the Amorites that were on the other side. She has heard how these people, these nations, these kings were utterly destroyed. If faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God, faith now has come to Rahab to begin to formulate, to think through some things, and ultimately obey and make a choice in her life. We go back over to Hebrews chapter 11, we see that she is the only one out of the entire nation who had to have heard the same thing, for she said, we have heard, meaning her neighbors, the government officials, they all heard but one chose to act upon it. Could others have been saved? I believe so. I believe others would not have been entirely wiped out if they just would have made the connection when faith coming, there's something different about this. We've been attacked before, but we are impenetrable. We are unscalable. We've seen these armies, but I have heard about this. There is something else that feels different about this. Faith is now present in her life. Now, what does she do? What does she do with it? 
we see that these signs and wonders that God performed were not only for the benefit of the Israelites, but they are to draw the attention of the unbelievers. And He still does that today. He used those signs and wonders where other people, I believe, could have been saved and not have perished in Jericho, but only one saw those signs and wonders and said, there's something different about this. That's why when God does something in your life, it is a benefit to you, but it also can be a calling sign, a warning sign, or a calling card for others who are sinners, who are unbelievers, that need what you have and the opportunity to share that with them. Verse 11. As soon as we had heard these things, there's that, there's that we. For Rahab, there's the hearing of the Word of God. As soon as we had heard these things, our hearts didn't melt, neither did, neither did there remain any more courage in any man because of you. For the Lord your God, He is God in heaven above and in earth below. Now think about that. As soon as we heard, our hearts did melt. Now, a lot, of, a lot of translations say a lot of, uh, uh, we, we fainted. We fainted. You know, we, we lost our courage. But actually, the next part talks about their courage. Yeah. It says, neither did there remain any more courage to any man. I believe that a better definition of this is that when their heart, or excuse me, when their heart did melt, because of the goodness of God, their heart did soften. Their heart did soften. They see they have an opportunity to make the same decision that Rahab made, but they continue to harden their heart. Rahab softened it. It was soft because she hears of the signs and wonders. She hears of the goodness of God. She hears of these things. And that softness, it gives her the opportunity to save her family. We see that... As she is saying these things in verse 11, she's communicating this to all the spies. She is saying that uh, um, any, uh, for the Lord your God, He is God in heaven above and in earth below. <clears throat> we heard all these things, our heart didn't melt, we lost courage. Now, she's telling who this? The Israelite spies. Now, she's telling them this. This is what we saw. This is what we heard. This is what we believe. Man, when we heard that you crossed the uncrossable barrier of the Red Sea, our hearts didn't melt, and we lost courage. We fainted. We are now in fear. Man, when we heard you did this to this king and this king and this king, our hearts did faint. We lost courage, and we're now afraid. That's interesting because over in Numbers 13, Moses sent out spies, 12 of them, And it says they went into the land and they saw all the fortified cities. They saw all the high-walled cities. They saw all the giants. And not only were they grasshoppers in in their sight, they obviously must have gone up to a giant and said, excuse me, sir, but how do you perceive me? And they said, oh, it's a grasshopper. Because it says not only were we grasshoppers in our sight, we were grasshoppers in their sight. That is a blatant lie. That's what they saw. That is not what Jericho saw. That is not what the people of Jericho uh, Jericho saw. That is not what Rahab saw. That is a blatant lie to what God had told them. And yet the Israelites believed that. And for a generation they were unable to cross over into the land of promise because what they believed about that situation. Rahab tells them the other side of the story. She had it right. She had the truth. We know that it's your God. We know this is your city. We know that you're coming for us. And Israel, who serves God, got it wrong. Well, we just saw ourselves as grasshoppers. That's why you shouldn't give a flying rip what other people think about you. You shouldn't give a flying rip how other people perceive you. You shouldn't care how people perceive you. You shouldn't care about any of that. No, because it's lies. Well, you know, I don't want to go over here because I might bump into so-and-so and, and, you know, know, they're, they're a hater. No, 
No. God goes before you. Amen. That's what he told them. Amen. I'm going before you. I am going to prepare the way. And so when you come up against a situation where you know that family reunion is going to have you know, some people that remember your past, that are so eager to bring up your past, that want to talk about your past, or when you're going to a section of town where you don't know you're going to run into so-and-so and you're afraid, you remember it doesn't matter how someone else perceives you. What matters is, is that God has gone before you. He has prepared the way you need to go in like the somebody you are. And I'm not talking about being arrogant. I'm not talking about being puffed up. I'm not talking about the pride of life. I'm talking about being the child of God that he's called you to be. That you walk in with the favor of God dripping off your shoulders. You walk in with the power of God operating in your life. And who cares what anybody else thinks? God has prepared the way for each and every one of you. All that time they were left out of the land of promise because of the, what they thought others saw them as. <coughs> and all the time the others saw them as this is over. It's just a matter of time. Going on. <clears throat> Verse 12. Now therefore I pray you, swear unto me by the Lord, since I have showed you kindness, that you will also show kindness unto me, my father's house, and give me a true token. Is that faith? That's faith. And if you were to ask me, this is what Hebrews 11.31, this is the verse in Rahab's life that Hebrews 11.31 is built off of. We see her in Hebrews 11, I believe, because of this verse right here. Notice she says, now therefore I pray you, swear unto me by, swear unto me by your God. Uh uh-uh. uh. She said, Swearing to me by the Lord. It sounds like to me she's already made a choice. It sounds like to me she's heard some things. Faith has come. And now she's saying, Your God is now my God. Now you swear to me by the Lord, by our God, that no harm will come to me. That since I have showed you kindness, that you will also show kindness unto me and my father's house and give me a true token. She is saying that this is the real God. We've heard about these things. I know who the real God is, and I want you to swear by the same God I now serve because He's Lord of my life. I choose God. I choose redemption. I choose the real Lord. And it goes on in verse 13. And that you will save alive my father and my mother, and brethren, and my sisters, and all that they have, and deliver our lives from death. And the men answered her, Our life for yours, if you utter not this, our business. And it shall be that when the Lord hath given us the land, that we will deal kindly and truly with thee. Then she let them down <coughs> by a cord through the window, for her house was upon the town wall. And that shows you the size, the majesticness of these walls. And she dwelt upon the wall. And we go on from there, we see that Rahab simply made a decision. By faith, Rahab saved her family. How? By making a choice and obeying the Word of God. She made a choice and said, this life that I've lived, this prostitution, the harlot that I am, these idols, these false gods, these wooden gods that I've served, compare nothing to this God that is marching up to the city walls. This is the real God. This is who I serve. I want to be a part of what God is doing over here. Now you swear to me, I'm going to protect you. I'm going to hide you. She takes them up. She hides them. Government officials come knocking on her door and say, where are these men? She tells them, you know, look, they came, but they are gone. If you leave now, I know the gate shut, you know, get out of here. Uh, you might get them, you know, uh, before the gate shuts or as the gate shut, you may get them, you know, so-and-so a few hours down the road. So they go, they don't find them. And the spies, after the government officials and the people leave, they come down and Rahab has this conversation. And she talks to them by faith. They, these spies that these men were looking for, they come down and Rahab talks to them by faith. Why? Because she's already talking about the things that have happened. She's already talking about the things that she is expecting to happen. That's what faith talks. 
Faith talks about what has already happened, regardless of what you feel in your body. Faith is already talking about the things that you are expecting to see. Why? Because of what God has already done. And that's the way that she is talking to them. She is saying, look, I protected you. I showed you kindness. Now you show kindness to me and my family. And she let them down a rope. And they said, look, we're going to give you this scarlet thread. You put this in your window. And we come up to Jericho. As long as you haven't betrayed us, then we will save you and your family. Now, if anybody in your family is outside your doors, then they are free game. But if anybody, if, we, if, if, if anybody is outside your doors, that blood is on you. But if anybody in your house with that scarlet thread is killed, that blood is on us. And please understand the prophetic word that that scarlet thread represents in your life. Because God let down a scarlet thread that was soaked in the blood of Jesus that is available for every sinner, that is available for every believer, so that them and their family do not have to perish. So what's the end game with Rahab? What happened to her? Turn over to uh, Joshua chapter 6, and I'm just about done. <coughs> Joshua chapter 6, <coughs> verse 25. Now, we haven't, even, we, haven't even <coughs> we haven't even torn down the walls of Jericho yet, all right? We'll get to that later, how the walls came down. But by now, the walls of Jericho have come down, all right? And it says in verse 25, And Joshua saved Rahab the harlot alive. And her father's household, and all that she had, and get this, and she dwelleth in Israel even unto this day. Think about that. They're at the writing of that book, at the writing of this, Rahab was a part of the nation of Israel. Even unto that day, she was not a Hebrew. She was not an Israelite. She got adopted into that covenant and in that family, and now she had the same protection and the same provision that those Israelites had, even to that day, because she hid the messengers which Joshua sent to spy out Jericho. Rahab and her whole house were saved because of that by faith moment. Now, by faith it's a choice it takes obedience turn over to James chapter 2 this is the last scripture but in James chapter 2 we're all familiar with this verse you can probably even quote it James chapter 2 verse 26 says this for the body without the spirit is what dead so faith without what works is dead some translations say, so faith without what? Corresponding actions is dead. That's the last verse in James chapter 2. Saying that without, without putting action, without advancing, without, you know, uh, without you know, working, without putting a corresponding action to your faith, your faith is dead. If you're going to do something by faith, it is going to take an action with it. That's why every by faith that is listed in Hebrews 11 has a verb attached to it because it implies action. It is doing something. Now you would think, oh man, because we're all, we're all familiar with that scripture. We know it. Man, faith without works is dead. We're quick to say it. Faith without works is dead. You know what the springboard for that scripture is? We would think, well, man, that, you know, yeah, that's probably, uh, that's probably Moses and those signs that he did, those signs and wonders. That was probably Samson and all those feats. That he did. No, in verse 25 it simply says this, Likewise also was not Rahab the harlot justified by works when she had received the messengers and had sent them out another way. I find that amazing that we springboard into 26 where it says the body, as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without action is dead. He references Rahab and her decision more than any, uh, I mean, she's the, he's the, well, besides Abraham, Abraham is listed earlier, but he lists Abraham and Rahab as the two, as the two characters, as the two people when it comes to faith without works is dead. Not Moses, not Noah, not any of that. And it's as simple as Rahab just made a choice. She just made a choice and she simply obeyed the word of God. 
It's amazing to me that verse 26 is the springboard with what Rahab did. And I love that part where she says this, when she had received the messengers. Now Hebrews 11 says she received them with peace. It matters how you receive somebody. It matters how, it matters how you receive something. It matters how you receive the Word of God. Well, that's not what I was wanting to hear. Well, you're not in peace already. <laughs> ah, David, I, no, uh-uh. No, your peace is disturbed. Yeah. Receive the Word of God with meekness. Amen, right. Receive the Word of God with peace. She hid these messengers. I mean, she hid the message yeah. that God had spoken to Joshua that was being carried out by these two spots. What does Psalms 119 verse 11 say? She hid these messengers. She hid and protected the message that God had delivered into the nation. Yeah. Psalms 119 11 says, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Oh, we need to hide the word of God in our heart. Amen. We need to hide the message of the word of God in our heart. Just like Rahab hid those spies, protected the Word of God, so we need to protect the Word of God, what He has spoken through others to us, what He speaks to us on a daily basis. Why? Because when you come up against those barriers, by faith, you can make a choice, you can obey, and you can save your entire household while everyone else is out there perishing and being wiped out. Can you say amen? amen. By faith. Rahab perished not. Amen.